welcome back. Welcome back. And now we are joined by a special guest. We have A.J. Perone Wilds, who is an interior designer, a national architectural and design manager, in fact. With Welcome great experience uh, with designing for autism and is also an autism mom. Yes. Uh, so many, many, many different <laughs> things that we want to talk about with you. But maybe we should start with autism mom. Yes. Were you a designer first and then became an autism mom? Did yes. that sort of, you know, help push you towards design for autism? I actually wanted to be an interior designer since I was in eighth grade. Wow. So I was one of those people that just was really driven and passionate about design and was an overachiever in college and was doing everything and um, actually was given a company to run at 25. Wow. wow. So it was... A design company. Yeah, a design build company. So, um, so I had a lot of experience, but my thesis in school was actually designing for Alzheimer's. Mm. And so I had studied so much about the psychological ramifications of the environment on other mental health issues. So when my son was diagnosed about age three, I immediately thought, well, there must be tons of research on this. There right. must be, you know, um, bookloads right, right, of, right. of uh, evidence-based research. And there was none. Yeah, there I was, was going to say, and then when you found out <laughs> that you were going to pioneer that yes. area, uh, was that exciting to you or was um, that daunting? It was really daunting, but it was. I luckily had amazing mentors. Um, there's actually doctorates of interior design, and I know most all of them. Okay. <laughs> and a few doctors of interior design uh, really encouraged me. They said, "You can do this. Mm -hmm. you, know, you need to. Someone needs to do this, and it might as well be you." So you just kind of took the lead in designing for autism. Yes, I really started looking at the neural functions mm -hmm. um, of what's happening in the brain and. Um, one of the first books I read that made me think, wow, there is there is something here, was Temple Grandin's Thinking in Pictures. Mm -hmm. Right. And understanding how she looked at the environment and what she was experiencing and how different it was. And as an interior designer, you design for the five senses, but you design for what it's like for you, right? It's your experience. And so what I've had to do is teach people design empathy. What is it like for some someone else experience that color or that brightness or how is that receptive to them and it might be completely different yeah. than it is in your own experience. So I'm curious when you're dealing with a client who wants to make a space that's more autism friendly what are some tips and tricks that you give them to make it more inclusive? So it's, it's interesting because it's changed over the years. The, the, the first you know, 10 years, we were trying to get people to minimize things uh -huh. and be able to control the environment, right? Whether right. it's color or lighting so or less acoustics. sensory input. Yes. And because think about it, everything designed for a child is in primary colors, right. which is for 90% of the kids with autism mm -hmm. is the worst thing in the mm -hmm. world. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so it's really hard to take color off of walls and the environments, but it's much easier to have a blank s slate and then add things and then being able to take them down. So it's mm -hmm. trying to change the philosophy so it doesn't look like Ronald McDonald came in there and threw up. Right, mm -hmm. right, you know? right. So um, that was, it's simplifying it. But then we actually had the challenge of, because everything was so simplified, it started to look institutional. Yes. And the families, like the mothers and the fathers and the grandparents, didn't like their child going yeah. into a place that felt like an institution. And the therapist actually had a hard time doing that. Yeah, it doesn't feel warm and gushy to right. them. And they need the stimuli, right. whereas these kids don't. Right. And so what we've had to do is figure out how to balance that, that framework and making sure that it is stimulating for the other caregivers and the right. therapists in certain areas where it's it's okay to have that or it's not primary mm -hmm. for you know therapy to be happening mm -hmm. there or something right. really pivotal and so they have enough stimuli that it makes them feel good that they're there absolutely and then it's still controlled for the individuals that need that therapy. Now we have some pictures of mm -hmm. some of the things, spaces that you've worked on and so talk to us a little bit about tell us what we're yeah. seeing. Yeah. Well, this is a home environment and um, it was interesting, it was for a little boy, and you can you can tell by the picture the color of the room, we changed it from yellow stripes 
to a light pink. Mm -hmm. Now this took, the the father of the little boy was not excited. (laughs) (laughs) But some of this came from the research of, I don't know if you've ever heard of the prison research studies on color, that they they painted all these prison cells different colors and found that this very subtle pink color was the one that actually kept people most calm. Mm. Really? And so um, through a lot of other research, that that warm kind of taupey, um, not Pepto Bismol pink, but right. like, you know, but something that's very um, pastel and muted uh-huh. and more in the warm tones. Tend the, the children tend to do better on that. So it's also simplifying. And it looks like you simplified. Yes. 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 yes, yes. So there wasn't as much sensory input. Right. right. And then there's a the toxicology standpoint. You know, okay. When you're looking at the environment and you're looking at all these kids have you know allergy issues mm-hmm. yes. and dust mm-hmm. mites and things mm-hmm. like that, and so you know, using like 100% wool, unless the child's allergic to wool, right. or cotton, and simplifying it, but also making sure that they're not getting any VOCs from the environment that's gonna make them worse. Yeah, okay. I think we've all gotten so used to like, when things come and they have a stench to it, a right. chemical stench. Right. I went to buy a pair of shoes, designer shoes, that were athletic shoes, and they, I opened the box, and the, the smell that oh. wafted off of them, I said, I, could, I had to get on a plane, and I said, they're not gonna let me on the plane with this. <laughs> And right, they, they they smell like they're going to catch fire, right. and the people in the store were like, "Oh, that's what all the shoes smell like." Right. And I yeah. said, "No, they don't. Open this one; it doesn't smell that yeah. way." We shouldn't be putting things in no. our kids' rooms so that take, have that smell. You take that into effect too, absolutely. And I'm I'm a designer that is a lead accredited professional, which is what does that mean? Um, lead is leadership for energy and environmental design, and so I've really helped push the toxicology effects mm-hmm. on human beings. And I have to say, like corporate environments and hospitals and all these other commercial regulated interiors, you could eat a lot of the furniture and stuff yeah. now. Mm-hmm. It's so, we were so vigilant yeah. on the types of adhesives we're using, the paint we're using, but mm-hmm. that doesn't always translate into the home environment. And yeah. things like the toy industry or yeah. the manufacturers for right. home goods, it doesn't always, we're not at that same level of diligence yet. I love that you're, you take that into consideration. So it's environmentally good and it, from a toxico- toxicology yeah. perspective, clean for the kiddos, because mm-hmm. that's important. Huge. Their little immune systems. Okay, yeah. let's go let's back look to the at picture. some other pictures. Well, yeah. I want to. Okay, let's go on to the next okay. one. Okay. So let's. this is um, this is nothing I designed, but this is one of the things that I show a lot of people. Um, this is a visual wayfinding board at the National History Museum in New York, and it's not there anymore because they changed all to iPads. But okay. what I loved about it, that's actually my son. Wow. Being able to ch- use actual pictures uh-huh. or peck symbols or things in the environment for wayfinding, uh-huh. we, we do a lot of that because it really helps that individual understand where they're going. Yeah. And so for, you know, whether, you, even if you don't speak English, which they have a lot of visitors that are right. not speaking English, they right. can go, oh, I want to go see the mummies. I go to floor three and here I go. And he could figure it out. Right. Um, anybody could. Mm-hmm. So it's looking at, you know, how do people... Um, if you're trying to make sure that these groups of individuals are as inclusive as possible, how do we look at wayfinding so that they can understand where to go in an airport or where to get a taxi or how to get navigate through a building and some of that's a safety concern too. Absolutely. If they can't get out of a building that's a problem. Now do you design mostly for larger sites or do you do mostly personal homes or a combination thereof? I've done everything. (laughs) So I've done a lot of personal homes a lot of personal spaces, um, classrooms, Mm -hmm. schools, entire schools, um, therapy clinics, everything from a private practicing doctor to Mm -hmm. a very large hospital. Um, I'm getting a lot of requests now, and I've served in in Minnesota on the Governor's Council for looking at um, autism and aging. And so, you know, they can't go into a regular group home. You right, know, that's right. not meeting their needs. Right. And they can't go into a senior living, mm-hmm. a typical senior living mm-hmm. space. So how do we create these environments that are going to make sure that they're successful mm-hmm. and that they're le- leading a happy life? And so um, it's interesting because as we see the, the number of kids increase and kids that are like my son's age, 22, yeah. now we're looking at all these aging factors. Yes. And um, it's a different it's a different set of circumstances, mm-hmm. but it's is as it's just as important as when they're little. 
Wow. Tell us about your son today and what he's doing. He's great. I mean, you would consider him to be severely autistic. Um, really? Yes. He is on the severe um, side. and he, In terms of, is he nonverbal? Is he, he, he speaks maybe six, seven words a day. Okay. He's very, you know, he's not, he can answer a question, but he's not conversational. Okay. Um, and he's still not good, like, it was super hot the other day and it came down wearing a sweater. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're like, dude, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So, and he, and he needs a PCA, but what we've found is um, through technology in our mm -hmm. home, we have cameras in our homes and we have sensors so we can see what he's doing. So now he's had a lot more independence of mm -hmm. living in our house without us, right. which is huge for him. Yeah, and huge um, for you too. Yes, and he's a great traveler. And I think that's one of the things I learned from the design aspect is, you know, Kids need their schedules, but sometimes being so adherent to it is actually not a good thing because then they can't transition into the world world, mm -hmm. right? right? And when your flight gets delayed, they melt down. Mm -hmm. And he, I, I call it like an environmental stimuli diet. <laughs> so at one point in his life, when he was four and five, we couldn't take him out of the house. You couldn't mm -hmm. take him into a retail store. Mm -hmm. You couldn't take him to the grocery store because he would just freak out. Mm -hmm. And my husband was like, well, let's just keep him at home. And I'm right. like, absolutely not. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. I am a person that goes lots of different places yeah. and doesn't do the same thing at all every day. Right. So he, right. this kid's got to learn how to deal with it. And so we would start in going to places, and he would maybe last, you know, at a children's museum 10 minutes. Uh -huh. But we kind of figured out some some ways to maybe make him do better, and we'd go back and we'd try it again. Right. And we'd give motivation until the point where, you know, by the time he was 10, I could fly him to Hawaii. Right. And he wouldn't get upset if the plane wasn't on time. Mm -hmm. And he sits in a five-star restaurant, no problem. I mean, yeah. he knows how to navigate in the real world. And now and he think, travels and speaks. Yes. yes. Tell us about yes. that. He's so speaking. He does speak when he's in front of an audience. And so how did you discover that? It was one of those things that... I had done a few political rallies for autism awareness right. and things like that, and he would I'd get him to come on stage and say yeah. one sentence, right. and he just loved it. Yeah. And so I got a call to um, this wonderful organization called Peace Love that um, creates a mental health awareness through art. Mm -hmm. And so it's a lot about art therapy. And they said, hey, would you come and talk about autism and art? Because we know your son loves to do art. And I said, well, sure, I can come and talk. Mm -hmm. but." Why don't we get him to talk? Mm -hmm. And they went, great idea. And I said, okay, let me tell you something. He really doesn't talk. <laughs> so this could be a disaster. And actually, the, the rehearsal was a disaster. Right. But when he got out there and he saw the audience and he saw how they reacted to him, he was like, this is what my, this is my calling. This what is, does he have to say when he, he talks? He loves it. He, oh, he talks about his art. Okay. He doesn't identify that there's anything wrong with him. Mm -hmm. Right. He doesn't think he has any type of disability, which is great. Yeah. You know, he thinks he's an artist. And he right. is. Of he's a, right. an he amazing an artist. artist. And he sells his work and he and it's um, it's getting put in a lot of healthcare organizations. Okay, great. You know, large organizations yeah. that treat kids yeah. like ours. Right. And so um, he's really been been making a name for himself. But wow. he loves it. the bigger the audience, the better. That's no fear. Fantastic. I absolutely love it. Great. Can we look at a couple okay. more of the pictures, Samantha? There was one you were showing that was from Frasier. Yes. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about this. Tell us a little bit about Frasier. So Frasier does autism therapy. It's the premier autism therapy center um, in Minnesota. And they we're just building their new Woodbury clearance. This was one of the smaller sites. So they're up to about seven sites now in the mm -hmm. metro area. Mm -hmm. And this you can see there's lots of bright colors and lots mm -hmm. of things going yeah. on. But the therapy environments are actually very neutralized. They're very, very controlled. Mm -hmm. um, we're using a lot of natural sunlight through solar tubes, but very, um, not a lot of color, mm -hmm. hardly any pattern, so that the therapists can bring that in when they need to. Sure. But the waiting room, that's actually the Mind Institute, um, but the waiting room, we added in a lot more color, and mm -hmm. that was more helpful for mm -hmm. You know the parents and how they felt mm -hmm. their child coming. Yeah. So this is the mind. So this is the mind institute, mind institute which is in uh, uh, Sacramento. Yes, and uh, it was interesting because we were actually patients of the old center, and oh, then the architecture firm called me and said, "Hey, could you help us on this?" Mm -hmm. I'm like, "We're actually patients," <laughs> and so we had really you bad experiences. Sunday. Yeah, we had really bad experiences in the old hospital, oh, and so I'm like, "Let me tell you the places that need to get fixed." There you <laughs> and go. So the new building had to not only be receptive to 
um, children with autism and their families, but also researchers. We're trying right. to get the best and the brightest and right. stealing them from you know AIDS research and cancer exactly. research. And mm -hmm. They need to feel like they're going to a beautiful place. So that is um, the, um, the lounge that you first walk into, and you can see there's hardly any pattern on the, on the flooring because that can be problematic for kids walking yes. through the space. We're using a lot of natural materials, a lot of natural light, which natural light is, is really, really important. Um, if they can go to the next slide, I think we're, we're going through, um, there we go, the waiting room. Waiting rooms can be very dramatic. Yeah. for families that are coming mm -hmm. in, especially if they don't have a diagnosis mm -hmm. yet. Yes. And it's not just a, a mother and a child, it's like the grandparents are there. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. we created these pods for the families to sit in for a good portion of the day. And it's actually looking out onto a um, secure courtyard. So if the kids have a half an hour break while they're interviewing the parents, the kids can be out in the courtyard running around oh, and doing vestibular yeah, yeah, activity. The Lovely. And that was January, so that's why it doesn't look so pretty. Well, but no, it's very pretty. Better than Minnesota in January. Not as lush as we're used to in California, but it looks very pretty. Yeah. Well, fascinating work. I mean, really interesting what you're doing. And Where can people what, find more information? So, um, one of the things that I did is I wrote three books. Okay. Um, because in your spare time. Yeah, in my yes. spare time. Um, it was help funded by ASID, which is American Society of Interior Designers, and I had so many requests coming in, and I've been very, very generous with all my research because to me it's about getting the information out. There's yeah. there's more projects that I could ever look at. And I also do, right now I'm focused on commercial design and workplace and that keeps me sane, you know, and there's there's ties between the two. Of course. Um, but I, I, I can't do autism all the time. Right. It's, of it's actually not. not healthy for me. Right, right. right. So um, writing these books was one way to get the information out. And it's written in a way that there's the scientific mm -hmm. and the very like textbook mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. So if you're an architect or designer, you, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, there's the personal stories and it, actual stories of actual clients mm -hmm. that parents can really relate to. Mm -hmm. So it wow. kind of has two sides to it. So how can people find those? Um, it's pretty easy. That's interior design for autism and you go on Amazon. They're all ebooks, mm -hmm. but they're based on age range. So because the individuals need different things at different ages. So yes. um, birth through age five and then kind of the um, school age years and then um, from early adulthood to geriatric. Okay. Wonderful. And Great. all available on Amazon. Yes. Thank you so Thank much you, for AJ. the work that you're doing yeah. and for coming and being with us today. Great. This was really fun. Thanks Very for having eye me. Eye opening. It was. Wonderful. And okay. congratulations on how well your son is oh, doing. Oh, thank you. That's thank a you. wonderful thing.